tonight. The food you buy, the gas you pump, the mortgage you pay. Canada's stubborn inflation ticks up. We want companies to do well in Canada. But we also want people to be able to eat. The impact on your street, the response on Ottawa's Hill. Fires in the Northwest Territories drive evacuees from their communities. I think about my daughter who's still at home. She has to leave. I mean, she has to get out. A fourth set of criminal charges for Donald Trump. Why the newest are different. They basically knowingly and willfully joined a criminal conspiracy. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. As Canadians continue to struggle with the cost of living, today's news comes as a blow. The annual inflation rate jumped last month, seeming to defy the series of interest rate hikes aimed at bringing it down. Let's look at the numbers. According to Statistics Canada, annual inflation rose to 3.3% in July. That's up from 2.8% in June. The familiar culprits, food, fuel, and the price of housing. Nisha Patel explains why some are calling for more government action. For months, inflation has been slowing, but that trend reversed in July, with the overall rate hitting 3.3%. Prices at the pumps were higher after declining dramatically over the past year. Homeowners are paying 30% more in mortgage interest. The price of electricity soared up nearly 12%. And while grocery prices aren't climbing quite as fast as before, they're still more than 8% higher than a year ago. I would buy butter for $3.99, now it's $7. And I'm a baker, like I buy 12 at a time. It's super expensive. There's certain things where I, was, I would get them more often and now it's like, oh, maybe only if it's on sale. As consumers around the world cope with stubborn food inflation, some governments are stepping in. France worked with large supermarket chains to cap prices on groceries like pasta, poultry and oil. It will cost retailers hundreds of millions of dollars. That just gave some predictability, pricing predictability for people during, you know, a scary inflationary time. While widespread price controls haven't worked well in the past, this policy expert says a limited freeze on some food basics could offer Canadians relief. We want companies to do well in Canada, but we also want people to be able to eat. Others aren't convinced it's necessary. The best method of fighting inflation isn't to try to pick one or two prices in the economy and intervene in them. It's really to control the pace of spending power. Since hitting a peak of more than 8% last June, inflation has fallen, with some bumps along the way. But the Bank of Canada says getting to its 2% target may not happen until the middle of 2025. We are getting some favourable trends in some of the underlying measures of inflation, and I think it's just a matter of patience. So, Nisha, after hearing all this, I, I can just imagine people at home saying, but wait, will the bank raise the rates again? The central bank has already raised interest rates 10 times over the past year and a half, going from near zero to 5%, the fastest pace ever, as it tries to get inflation under control. Now, those rate hikes are having an impact. The labor market is cooling, consumer spending is slowing, though experts are split over what happens next. We will get one GDP report before the bank meets. That could be a deciding factor. And while it isn't the most likely scenario, there is a chance, Adrian, that rates will go up again in September. All right, Nisha Patel, thank you. You're welcome. Now in Ottawa, the inflation news made for talking points from politicians, plans for spending cuts from the government, and as Kate McKenna shows us, heaps of criticism from the opposition. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev's reaction was swift. I'm calling on Justin Trudeau to recognize the inflation crisis he has caused. He spent months positioning the Conservative Party as the more affordable option for Canadians. Just inflation has struck again. Trudeau's inflationary taxes and deficits have sent prices rising again. Experts say that might be a bit simplistic. Canada is not the only one in this position. The United States is looking at the same, uh, same problem. But Polyev's relentless hammering may be having an impact. His party has enjoyed a big bump in polls this summer. Cost of living issues are just driving politics right now. Um, seven in ten people are, are basically, I think it's one of the top issues facing us right now. It's really driving politics and it's really bad news for the government. The government says it stands by its record. Inflation is coming down, jobs are being created, and the Canadian economy is strong and resilient.
And as Canadians tighten their belts, so will the federal government. It plans to cut $15 billion in spending. We need to maintain a fiscally responsible position. And the $15 billion of refocused spending is about precisely that. In this letter, first reported by the Globe and Mail, Treasury Board President Anita Anand asked Cabinet Ministers to find places to cut and to submit proposals by October 2nd. From my perspective, it cannot be programmed service delivery, and so I'll be having a conversation with Minister Anand about how we do this. That's top of mind for the NDP leader too, and it's his party's support that keeps this minority government in power. I'm concerned that in a time when people are already feeling so squeezed that these cuts might mean cuts to things that Canadians need. When the House of Commons sits this fall, Canadians can expect more of this from the opposition, trying to channel financial pain into political gain. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. The Northwest Territories has declared a state of emergency. Officials say this will allow them to better respond to an unprecedented wildfire season prompting thousands to flee. So currently, half a dozen communities, most from the South Slave region, are being evacuated, including Fort Smith and Hay River. Most of the evacuees have fled to Alberta, finding shelter in Grand Prairie and St. Albert. Carolyn Dunn now on their stories of escape and loss. This is all that remains of Natasha Cleary's home in Enterprise. After fleeing fires with her six traumatized children and their pets, Cleary remains in shock. I think the hardest thing is just not knowing what's next, uh, not knowing what we're going to do with our kids, and uh, I, don't, I don't know, I'm just speechless. Now that these flames are out, the damage is clear and devastating. Between 85 and 90 percent of the community is gone. I think there are seven or eight houses left and three or four businesses. We're very close in the community. We're all friends and uh, it's painful. Rita Plunkett and her family made it to an evacuation centre in Grand Prairie, Alberta, by road. What she saw sticks with her. It was really dark and just red in the bag. It looked just very eerie and there's just a uh, bumper-to-bumper vehicle uh, all the way down here. Yeah, we were a bit scared and worried, yeah. Belinda and Mike Mandeville were stuck for hours on a closed highway between Yellowknife and Hay River with a first-hand view of the damage the raging wildfire caused. Just to stand here and talk to you and think about my daughter who's still at home and she has to leave. You know, she has to get out. We're hoping for a better outcome this afternoon. Yeah. And hoping to hear she caught on, jumped on the plane with five dogs. Officials are pleading with those who stayed behind to catch a military plane out of Hay River Airport as soon as possible. On Sunday, flames were so dangerous, even firefighters had to be pulled out of Fort Smith. But a little rain yesterday has bought them some precious time. Still, there is lightning and worry in the forecast. We have fire season every year. This is unprecedented. It is not something that we're used to. It is very scary. And life-changing for those living through it. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. In Hawaii, officials are starting to identify victims killed by the wildfires. At least 99 people have died from the flames. And as Magda Gabrasalasa shows us from Maui, that death toll is expected to climb. It's a tragedy beyond tragedies. Maui police began identifying some of the victims of the Lahaina wildfire. Dozens of bodies have already been recovered. But with crews and sniffer dogs still searching, the governor is expecting that number to go up significantly. It went up about um, 15 people in the last day. So you can get an idea that over the course of the next 10 days, this number could double. In fact, some reports suggest more than 1,000 people remain unaccounted for. Residents who survived are now airing concerns about the long-term effects of the disaster area. I mean, what's all this is like? It looks still smoldering. It's toxic, hazardous. With roadblocks still in place, this group of protesters say they found ways into the area and found people that haven't been checked on. We went up to a neighborhood, Lahaina Luna, up above the fire, forgotten about. No one had been up there. So much kapuna, so many elderly people. Maui's mayor says it's the first time he's hearing this. So I can't imagine anybody not having enough uh, supplies that, that we've provided. And there's even more being brought in. 
The displaced are being moved from shelters to hotel rooms and Airbnbs. As for tourists, there's been some pushback on whether they should still keep coming. It was a really hard decision for me when I was deciding if I should come here. Tara Joy McNurthney is from Toronto, but was raised in upcountry Maui. She just arrived to come see her parents. They were incredibly fortunate, they were upwind, and then my thought was, all right, well, can I ethically come to Maui? So I posted on social media to ask my Maui community. She said people told her to come and volunteer. The governor is just asking travelers to avoid West Maui. As for President Joe Biden, he'll be coming, but did not give a specific date. We want to be sure we don't disrupt the ongoing recovery efforts. And to assist with that, family members of missing loved ones are being asked to come to this center here to report it, to get information, and to be swabbed for DNA to help identify the victims. So, Magda, I gather the search crews have gone through about 25% of the site. What do we know about how long they may be at this? Well, yesterday the police chief said that he hoped that crews would get through about 85 to 90 percent of the site by this weekend. And of course, people are being told to brace for the death toll to go up in that time. All right. Magda Gabrasalasa in Maui tonight. Thank you. While Hawaiians search for their dead, rage builds about something some believe made those fires worse. Look at this. Freaking power line just went down. So this video was shot on Maui on August the 8th by Shane True. Listen to what he's saying. See him right there. That's the power line that started. Started from up the road there. And all of that is still burning. So he's talking about fires sparked by live wires downed by wind. So does Hawaiian Electric bear any responsibility for what happened in Maui? A class action suit was filed against the utility on the weekend alleging Hawaiian Electric chose not to de-energize their power lines during the high wind watch and red flag warning conditions for Maui before the Lahaina fire started and still didn't, even when they knew vegetation had come in contact with the lines. The utility CEO says the company doesn't have a shutoff program like that and there could be complications. In Lahaina, the electricity powers the pumps that provide the water. And so that was also a critical um, me during that time. Fires from falling live lines are a familiar trauma. In 2020, California power company PG&E pled guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter after it was blamed for what was called the campfire. So many destructive fires caused by down lines there that California made changes. If, um, you know, something comes into contact with a live wire, whether it be a tree or anything else, the line basically shuts down on contact. The company has also been working to learn how to um, drive down the cost of putting lines underground. And to Hawaiian Electric's claims that the risks of shutdown are high, Catherine Blunt is empathetic, but she says California is innovating. They're trying to install more technology that can allow for like a more surgical approach to, to shut down so that you're not blocking out large parts of the grid for long periods of time. So are there lessons for Canada here? Of course, more heat, drought, stronger wind, power lines. That's a dangerous combination here too. There are emergency shutoff systems here, but maintaining lines better, maybe burying more. This is a conversation every country coping with wildfires is having right now. Donald Trump is firing back tonight, one day after facing his fourth indictment in less than five months. In this case, Trump will be tried alongside 18 alleged co-conspirators. As Ashley Burke shows us, prosecutors aren't backing down and the clock is already ticking. The Georgia district attorney who delivered the indictment gave Donald Trump 10 days to turn himself in. We do want to move this case along and so we will be asking for a proposed order that occurs a trial date within the next six months. Trump's response one day later came in a flurry of posts calling the DA corrupt, saying he'll issue his own irrefutable report on Monday and that there will be complete exoneration, then released a video. Justice and the rule of law are officially dead in America. Unlike earlier federal charges, this Georgia indictment of Trump and 18 others includes racketeering charges, often used to go after mob bosses. It kind of permits uh, prosecutors to kind of tell a story about a large conspiracy or a large criminal enterprise uh, that basically has certain higher-ups and then almost like an octopus has these tentacles that kind of reach out. 
Trump was the head while former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and advisor Rudy Giuliani were among the co-conspirators. The allegations that they refused to accept that Trump lost and they knowingly and willfully joined a conspiracy to unlawfully change the outcome of the election in favor of Trump. If you didn't participate in one part of the conspiracy, you didn't say uh, intimidate a witness, you still are held responsible for the acts of your co-conspirators, and that's what makes these things so difficult to defeat. Some showed up with flowers to thank Willis. She's throwing the book at him, and she's also going after everyone, and that's a valid approach. Uh, what it, it does mean is there's more opportunities for flippers. Uh, for example, cooperators who could help her side. Arrest warrants are now out in Georgia, where authorities already warned that Trump would be treated like any other criminal defendant. Unless someone tells me differently, we are we are following our part our, our normal practices, and so it doesn't matter your status. We we have mugshots ready for you. So, Ashley, with Trump now facing a fourth potential trial and a presidential campaign, how does this work out logistically? Well, Adrian, it's possible that Trump could stand trial in all of these cases before the next presidential election. Prosecutors have asked for the federal election interference case to go to trial in January. Another is scheduled for March, that case over alleged hush money payments to an adult film star. And the trial tied to Trump's handling of classified documents is set for next May. But experts say that Trump's legal strategy is to try and delay, delay, delay. All right, thanks, Ashley. Ashley Burke in Washington. There's a lot more to delve into on Trump's legal troubles, including the strength of the charges against him and why he's being indicted both on the federal and state level. We'll break down all of that and more in about 15 minutes. So in this country, members of the military with complaints of sexual misconduct or discrimination can now take their grievances directly to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. The change follows recommendations in a report last year from former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour. Previously, members of the military could only go to the commission after they'd exhausted the military's internal grievance procedures. There's an update tonight on New Brunswick's controversial gender identity policy in schools. The province's child and youth advocate says it violates children's rights. Kayla Hounsell has reaction from the LGBTQ community and the premier. We have so far, since I've come out, been a safe place. Alex Harris says he helped organize this protest a few months ago to stand up for trans kids who don't have the same support he had. He's pleased with the new report from New Brunswick's child and youth advocate. He had to say the same things as I've had to say most of the time, that it's just, it's not fair to kids to expect parental permission just to use the correct pronouns for them. The advocate says the public is divided, but his view is that New Brunswick's policy violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Provincial Human Rights Act. Frankly, there's no sign anybody before passing this thing did the basic test of going, let's check other statutes and see if we broke the law, because it does break the law. I haven't read the report. Maybe there's something there that, that is, uh, will, will help us move along, but, um, but my belief in the, in the role of parents is, is certainly... Uh, as it has always been. Now widely known as Policy 713, it was introduced three years ago to help provide an inclusive environment for LGBTQ students. Preferred pronouns were to be respected. But in June, the government made changes, making it mandatory for teachers to deny a request to change pronouns without a parent's consent. The goal, they said, was to protect parental rights. Discrimination by oversight, however, is still discrimination. Lamrock recommends staff go back to respecting all students' pronouns if they're in grade 6 or higher. For younger children, he says it should be up to the principal to decide if the child has the capacity to make that decision. The recommendations are not binding. I'm terrified for September because that's going to be that's going to be when we really see the effects of this. He says the new report strikes a fair balance and he's calling on the provincial government to give it serious consideration. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Toronto Maple Leafs legend Bobby Bond has died. Up they come to center. Over the line, the puck goes into the corner. Al Langlois after it. He comes back to Bob Bond. He shoots. He scores! Bob Bond shot. 
There he is, that's Bond scoring a game-winning goal in the 1964 finals against the Detroit Red Wings. The defenseman became legendary for scoring it with a broken leg. Bond played 17 seasons in the NHL, winning four Stanley Cups with the Leafs. He was 86 years old. Well, two years after the Taliban takeover, the situation is dire for Afghanistan's women. It is terrible. I mean, I mean, unbelievably terrible. Coming up, living in fear, courageously searching for freedom. Plus, a fourth indictment for Donald Trump. The defendants engaged in a criminal racketeering enterprise a closer look at the mafia-busting law used to charge the former U.S. president. And that's a wrap. A dusty Donair costume sells for $16,000. We're back at two. The United Nations says the situation in Sudan is spiraling out of control. More than a million people have fled. And for those left behind, a brutal power struggle between paramilitaries and regular army is destroying lives. The UN also says food supplies are running out, health care is disappearing, and sexual assaults have doubled. Well, today marks two years since the fall of Kabul. And for Afghanistan's women and girls, hope there is in short supply too. Their lives shrink with each passing month, and they fear abandonment by the wider world. Margaret Evans looks at how some are clinging to the possibility of a better future. Two years after the fall of Kabul sealed the Taliban's victory, Afghan women are still fading from sight, barely visible. Each new law to subjugate them, harder to recover from. We are erased, we are annihilated, we are gone. We have no rights. Renowned activist Mahbuba Siraj still can't quite believe it's happening. The fear of women gatherings is becoming like a, like a phobia here. What is this? Honest to God, I don't understand it. It is terrible. I mean, I mean, unbelievably terrible. Some, like this young woman whose identity we are protecting for her safety, have found a lifeline through the internet, studying secretly courtesy of an online American university. I can see some peers, uh, some classmates on the university. Uh, we can exchange ideas. She knows she has advantages compared to others. She has English and access to electricity and the internet for now. We are afraid of what will happen next. Uh, I have been talking to some other girls and they were saying, we are afraid. And one day they will say, you have to stop breathing. You have to stop living in this world. Yes, we are afraid. We want freedom. We want freedom. How then to help from afar? Western governments and Afghans themselves, wherever they are, don't agree on how or whether to engage with the Taliban. I think meetings with the Taliban is indirectly legitimizing them as a form of government in power. Given the hard realities of life in Afghanistan, Mahbuba Siraj doesn't want lectures from the diaspora. If the people of Afghanistan die of hunger, all of us, what do I want to do with education? What do I want to do with the rest of the freedoms? I really don't need it. You see, that's where we are. With the lines of the Taliban hardening, little boys being taught to disrespect their mothers and little girls that they don't matter. We are really depressed and we are, um, I cannot say how I feel because it's really hard. More important than ever to keep them in sight. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Donald Trump's latest indictment is the most sweeping so far and unlike the other three. The indictment brings felony charges against Donald John Trump. Coming up, what these charges mean for the former U.S. president and the Republican Party. Plus, two years ago, their orchestra was silenced when the Taliban took over. Tonight, the music lives. This is my weapon. I will talk to you guys with this. Their story of perseverance is ahead. Plus, 
it was uh, definitely the experience of a lifetime. A special gift for a heavy metal hero. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. The indictment brings felony charges against Donald John Trump. It's another historic moment in a series of historic moments. Former U.S. President Donald Trump indicted again. This, the fourth case against him, adding up to a combined 91 charges. The first indictment less than five months ago. Trump accused of falsifying business records linked to a payment to Stormy Daniels. Since then, the case involving classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago home. USA! USA! The January 6th insurrection case. And now accusations of trying to meddle with Georgia's election results specifically. In part stemming from this now infamous phone call with Georgia's Secretary of State. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have because we won the state. But it didn't start there. The Georgia prosecutor outlining a series of alleged acts, 161 to be exact, by Trump or others. Some as small as sending an email, others more overt, including that pro-Trump operatives gained access to voting machines in southeastern Georgia and stole data. The individuals taking part described as part of an enterprise, a team of people conspiring with a common goal. 18 of them now face charges alongside the former president. So let's break all of this down with our Washington correspondent, Paul Hunter, and Georgia State University assistant law professor, Karen Morrison, who was also a former assistant U.S. attorney. So, Karen, if we can begin with you, a lot of this can make you kind of dizzy trying to catch up with the details. And Donald Trump is already facing criminal charges for election interference federally. So some might be wondering, why go after him at a state level, too? So I'm, I think you have to sort of bear in mind that you're dealing with two separate sovereigns, two separate systems of government. Um, if he's violated federal law, that's um, an issue for the Department of Justice and for federal prosecutors to go after. But um, he's also broken the state law in Georgia. And in order to vindicate the rights of the Georgians and the Georgian voters, um, the, the case needs to be brought here because the state has a different interest in prosecuting this case, this particular case, than um, the, 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 the Department of Justice. I suppose the message in that is, is that if they don't uh, attempt to prosecute, then the signal to the next person who may a attempt to interfere with an election is, is go for it. Yeah, which is absolutely not <laughs> what, what, what anybody wants. I mean, no, this, we don't want to descend into chaos. And when people discuss the rule of law and how, you know, um, the law needs to be applied without fear or favor, that's, we're sort of at the, the nitty gritty of what that's kind of about. It's, does it really apply to everybody, even up to a former president? And, you know, I think the answer, at least in, um, from Fannie Willis in Fulton County is yes, it applies to all. And on the, the matter of, of racketeering, this RICO charge, from what I gather, those trials can get very lengthy, complicated. So what's the advantage of going that route? I think the advantage of going that route is that it enables the prosecutor to tell a much broader story. It enables them to... It's, RICO is a good way of dealing with complex cases with a lot of interlocking people who are connected in some way as well as um, a, a number of different acts, which might seem desperate, but um, all together form a type of pattern. So when there's a lot of moving parts, RICO is a great way to go, um, simply from a prosecutorial standpoint. And so, Paul, if we step back here, we're now, I guess, at the fourth set of criminal charges for the former president. People are starting to use spreadsheets. I know you've seen them to figure out the charges. What effect does this appear to be having on either the Republican Party in particular or the whole American electorate? <laughs> Adrian, 
we've had this conversation before. <laughs> we've had it, this is the fourth time, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the last four months that we've been talking about this. And, and the answer is simple uh, and yet hard to fathom. And, and that is, it probably will have no effect. You know, it's sort of like, remember in the, in the depths of COVID when it was still raging and there was kind of COVID fatigue came along. Well, the, the storm around Donald Trump is still raging and the threat to, uh, uh, you know, U.S. democracy is still raging, but there's a fatigue, right? A lot of people just say, okay, yeah, we know all this stuff. He, he did bad things. Uh, let's move on. So that's not going to change anything. On top of that, you know, feelings about Donald Trump are effectively baked in, and they have been for years now. So, you know, because Trump has managed to portray himself throughout this process as the victim, as a martyr, as uh, somebody the Democrats are out to get, that the swamp is out to get, that everybody is out to get him. And the MAGA crowd with the red ball caps have come to believe that. This won't change that. It, the needle won't move a fraction. At least that's the expectation. So if, if they're at a position where he is far ahead in the polls, ahead of his closest rival uh, for the Republican nomination, Ron DeSantis, what does it look like his opponents might be doing to use this indictment? Will they use it against him? Will they just, uh, what are they going to do? <laughs> Good question. Because <laughs> nothing so far, really, nothing has stuck. Let's put it that way. And by the way, it sort of depends what you mean by opponents, because mm. it's safe to say still uh, that there's probably nobody Joe Biden would choose other than Donald Trump to run against, because he and other Democrats still think that's a, a winning gambit. The other opponents are the fellow uh, Republican candidates for the nomination. Uh, and aside from, you know, nuanced comments from DeSantis and Pence and Nikki Haley, uh, and except for the sort of hired gun that, that Chris Christie seems to be, it's been crickets, right? Because there is fear still to speak out against this guy uh, amongst the Republicans. We may find out next week uh, at the, there's a, the first Republican uh, candidates debate. Um, Donald Trump may be there. He hasn't said he will be. He may or may not be there. But regardless, the rest will be there. Given the news this week, right, the fourth in four months, uh, this is the chance for the others to say, he's not good for this country. I am, right? This is their chance. We'll see. Karen, uh, last thought to you. It's, it's a big question, unfortunately. What, wh how much is riding on this uh, clean judicial process being a clean judicial process for America's democracy? Well, I think if you take the allegations as true, or at least, you know, probable, um, I'd say everything pretty much is riding on, on the, maybe not on this specific prosecution, but on whether there is accountability for um, attempting to overturn an election. Because if there isn't, Kind of as you pointed out, then when will and when will we ever have a peaceful transfer of power again? It'll just be a game of you know you get elected, you hold on as long as you can until maybe the military ushers you out. Um, so I, I do think that we are at an, an important inflection point, and um, you know it's the kind of thing that keeps us Americans up at night sometimes. I bet. All right, uh, Karen and Paul, thank you both for being here tonight. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Still to come, the Taliban tried to silence them. Everything is just like, like a movie, like a horror movie that is going on, you know? Next, how Afghanistan's all-female orchestra is keeping music alive somewhere else. Plus, a medallion for Metallica that puts indigenous beadwork on center stage. As Margaret Evans showed us earlier, it's been two years since the Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan. Well, today, armed soldiers were seen celebrating in Kabul, driving military vehicles with white Taliban flags. So part of what we saw in Margaret's story was the impact the Taliban has had on the lives of girls and women in Afghanistan. We wanted to take another look, though, at a story about the resilience of one of Afghanistan's most precious jewels, an all-female orchestra created at a time when 
peace and hope seemed within reach. There they were a few years ago, invited to perform at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. A heady moment and a dream realized for Zora, Afghanistan's first all-women's orchestra. From those so thrilled to be there then, a message for you now. Listen to them. Remember these smiles and sounds because this is the Afghanistan they want you to know. Not this one. When the Taliban took over the cacophony of violence and chaos, silenced all the sweet notes, especially here. The famed music school, built in 2010 as a place of promise for those emerging from life under the Taliban's grip. For young women in particular, it was a refuge. Now the girls are gone. Taliban fighters infest those colorful halls it's become a militia base, armed men lurking in treasured spaces where music education once meant wings. Today, the performance of this young musician clearly demonstrated how easily music can be understood by every single man and woman of this planet. Building, then nurturing the school, was Dr. Ahmed Sarmas' purpose in life. This orchestra for me always was as a symbol of freedom symbol of emancipation of women. He spends days and nights checking on his students. We've been in the full in the process of uh, getting our students to a safety and security. I advise them to delete all the messages, deactivate their Facebooks, uh, do not connect with their friends uh, outside Afghanistan. Some have gone into hiding. Others, like conductor Zarifa Adiba, had left a few years earlier to go to university abroad. Her friends, family back in Afghanistan, while well, she sits in Kyrgyzstan, and it haunts. Their text messages are hard to take. I don't have quite good words to describe how these days and nights are passing. I suppose there's a difference between existing and living. Exactly, like everything is just like, like a movie, like a horror movie that is going on, you know? So I see my friends, um, they are breaking their instruments. They're, they're breaking it before Taliban get to them, you know? So for them, I don't think that music is at the moment their comfort, but it's more of a risk for them. Music once filled the mountains and valleys and streets and souls of Afghans. Decades ago, when the Taliban took control, they banned it. And now that they're back in charge, public performances are once more outlawed. The Afghan folk singer Fawad Andarbi was pulled from his home and killed by the Taliban not long ago. Imagine the chill that sends to the young women of Zora, alternately afraid of and cherishing the power of music. Music has always been my friend, has always been my comfort, even especially in times like this that I feel hopeless, I feel tired, I feel scared. As conductor Zarifa was a leader, working with, learning with, the likes of pianist Maram Ati. She moved to the music school as a teen, worked with Dr. Sarmast for years, touring with Zora. Then a few days before Kabul fell, she left for university in Michigan to study piano. Her heart clearly still at home and with friends now asking for help and advice. I just told them that don't tell anyone, don't uh, play if someone of the neighbor could hear a piano playing or something, just don't touch it. 
and be careful. She sadly urges those back in Afghanistan not to fight too hard to save the music. Fighting now is not a good idea. If someone just stood up and fight for music, you cannot do that right now. But I think all of this 20 years of hard work, it cannot go to waste like that. So maybe in the future, I, I believe that um, someone or people were just start uh, from the beginning again. And for the women, dreams waver. Between trying to hold the memory of the togetherness they once had, the bold performances of traditional songs, and hoping to somewhere, someday, let the music's power speak again. Every note talks to me and tells me that Zaifa don't give up. Zaifa, play more, play louder. At the same time that my violin is peaceful, comforting, and beautiful, at the same time it is so powerful and so strong and so rebellious, you know? Zarifa's new life includes this new violin. Beautiful bought with help from supporters. She was just starting to get acquainted with it. This is going to be my weapon, you know? Taliban are, go are, are having their weapon, but this is my weapon. I will talk to you guys with this. The Taliban scattered and silenced the orchestra, but the spirit of Zora lives and the women promise they will be heard again. Since we first brought you that story almost two years ago when the Taliban took over, the Afghan National Institute of Music has found a new home in Portugal. More than 275 teachers and students at the institute were granted asylum there. And they've reestablished the school in Lisbon. For many, this is a bittersweet relocation. Safe, but not home. Students say one day they hope to return to Kabul and bring music home, they hope, to a liberated Afghanistan. It was the moment of my life. It has a, a lot of meaning behind it. Still to come, Metallica gets a special gift. And the fight over a hotly contested Donair costume is over. Well, this, this is not your average tinfoil wrap Donair costume. This has been the subject of a weeks-long bidding war after being put up for auction by the government of Alberta. Why would the government do that? Sounds odd, no? Well, the Donair duds were originally bought for a campaign that never ended up happening. So the province put it up for sale. Cue the frenzy. In the end, the swanky costume went to an Edmonton-based Donair chain, of course for $16,000. Well, this beaded medallion is in the shape of a Metallica logo, and this weekend, it became a token of appreciation from a fan to one of his heroes. So it was handmade by Chief C.P. Flamand of the Atikamek First Nation community in Manawan, Quebec. And tonight, the heavy metal gift is our moment. It was uh, definitely the experience of a lifetime. I was a huge fan of Metallica, and uh, for the show of Metallica, I, uh, I just wore the medallion and I went with it. And Robert Trujillo is the, the basis of Metallica. When he was on the platform, back to me, and I put to him, and it was the moment of my life. It was the best day of my life so far. You can see after I put the medallion on him, and I said to him, it's indigenous, and after I say that to him, he raised his fist. So I think he was very proud to receive a medallion that is indigenous from Canada. The medallions are all handmade, and uh, it has a big uh, form of symbolism. I know a lot of uh, indigenous from my villages and love Metallica, so it, it has a, a lot of meaning behind it. That's amazing. So Denique said he uh, had that medallion beaded for him 10 years ago. He actually wore it 
in grade six uh, at his uh, talent show that, that is national for Tuesday, August the 15th. Have a good night.